I wanna do something different in this video. I wanna talk about why I think there is a mistake in Hetziorma's derivation on drift velocity. If you've read his book, you know that in his case, he gets the drift velocity to be half times e by m into tau, whereas most other books, and I'm looking at Richard Feynman's lectures, which I think is a pretty solid source of physics. In his book, he derives, he gets the expression to be, um, there's no half over there. You can see there's an m and there's a tau, and this e into e is the same thing as force, but there's no half. And the common answer to this discrepancy is that, hey, both results are right, they have made their own assumptions. I don't think so. In fact, Richard Feynman, if you read further, and I've linked um, in the description this particular, uh, like, you know, this particular source, um, he actually goes ahead and says that there is a wrong way to derive, and if you do it, you get half into, <laughs> half into f into tau divided by m, and I think, that's exactly what has happened. There has been a mistake and he points out that that mistake, the second result is wrong and the reason for that is somewhat subtle. And that's the goal of this video. I wanna talk a little bit about what, what could be that subtle thing that might have gone wrong over here. Treat this as a conversation starter. Um, there's a good chance that I may be wrong as well. That maybe there are certain differences in assumption and would love to hear your thoughts on it, but hear me out. So let's start with some context. What exactly is this drift velocity? Well. The electrons inside a conductor don't move in straight lines. If there is an electric field, they get accelerated and they constantly bump into things. And we're gonna assume that after they bump, they're gonna lose all the memory of their acceleration of their velocity and they're gonna start afresh. And then again, they're gonna accelerate and they're gonna bump and then keep on happening. As a result, they don't go in straight lines, they keep bumping constantly, but slowly and steadily they keep moving, making their way through and the average velocity with which they slowly make their way through is the drift velocity. That's the velocity that contributes to the current, not the random motion, all right? That's why it's important to calculate how much that drift velocity is. So let's follow along um, Professor's uh, line of thought. So I'm gonna start by looking from here. The stuff about that we can ignore as of now, I'll come back to it a little bit later. But it says, as the time t between successive collision is small, the electron slowly and steadily drifts opposite in the electric field, all right? If the electron drifts a distance l in a long time t, we define the drift speed as vd is equal to l divided by t. That makes a lot of sense to me because you know if you want to calculate the average velocity, take a long time. Right, you wait for a billion collisions, calculate what is the total distance traveled in that billion collisions, divide by the total time taken for that distance travel, and that makes sense. This is perfect, I completely agree with this. But at this point, there might be a confusion. You might say, but Mahesh, this is talking about one single electron. There are so many electrons. Shouldn't you also consider all the electrons while averaging them out? Not necessarily. One way of averaging things out is you can take one electron and consider n collisions. So you can consider a billion collisions and then average it out over those billion collisions. Or you can take, sorry, you can take n electrons, like a billion electrons, and consider one collision for all of those billion electrons and then average it out over all those billion electrons. Both of them should give you the same result. Why? because remember we said that after collision, the electron forgets its memory and like starts fresh. This makes these travel paths independent of each other. So these are independent events, right? And when you have independent events, it doesn't matter whether you consider them one after the other or at the same time. It's kind of like saying that you take 100 coins and toss them all at once, or you take one single coin and toss them 100 times. The probability that you will calculate for anything stays the same because you're dealing with independent events. So, um, you know, you can, you can do it for this or you can do it for that. Uh, Professor Verma takes one electron, considers a billion collisions, averages it out and says that that same average value applies to all the other electrons, which make perfect sense. You could have done the other way around as well. So <clears throat> it doesn't matter which one you consider, you should end up with the same answer. Okay, moving ahead, the book says, if tau be the average time between successive collisions, the distance drifted during this period L is equal to half a tau square. At this point, I pause. I pause because there's some averaging happening over there, and I usually don't like to do averaging in my head. I like it when there are things laid out, and so then I can add them and then divide them by the total number. That's, that's more intuitive for me. So before going over there, I'm gonna do that, all right? And then I'll see if I can make sense of this, okay? 
So if I come back to my one electron doing n collisions, the, the first thing I understand is that between any two successive collisions, the electron is under uniform acceleration. It is having a constant force, giving it a constant acceleration. So I can use equations of motion. S equal to ut plus half at squared will work over here, but it'll only work between two collisions, right? Because once the collision happens, then you have a different force. Um, and then I have to restart, all right? So what I'm gonna do is to calculate this length over a long time, I'm gonna calculate what the length over here is, and then here is, and then here is, and then here is, and then here is separately, because I can do that, I can use equations of motion, then add them up, and then divide by the total time. So I'll consider them separately. So let's say those lengths are L1, L2, L3, L4, L5, in the time interval T1, T2, 3T, T3, T4, and T5. So if I were to calculate drift velocity from this point, this is how I would think about it. Drift velocity is the length over time. You consider a long time. And so that'll be like L1 plus L2 plus L3, L5, you can, L billion. Imagine there are billion collisions happening. So T1 plus T2 all the way to T billion. All right, this is how I would do it. Okay, now let me go and talk. look at what this sentence is. It says, if tau be the average time between the successive collisions. Again, I'm gonna pause. Um, what does that mean? Average time between successive collisions? Well, you can see that between any two successive collisions, the time taken changes, right? So over here it's T1, here it is T2, here it is T3. It could be completely different times. So uh, over here, the book is talking about an average time. So the first thing I'll do is I'll look at my uh, situation and I'm gonna ask myself, in my case, what would tau look like? Well, I know the time for individual, you know, uh, time between two successive collisions individually. I know that. Now if I have to average them out, then basically I add up all the time and divide by the number of collisions, right? So for me, tau would be T1 plus T2 plus T3 and so on. Divide by, it, it's five, in this case it's five, but actually it's gonna be a billion. If there are billion time intervals that I'm taking, that's gonna be divided by a billion. All right, so I'm, I'm, I'm good. This statement makes sense. If tau is the average time between successive collisions. And now comes, now comes the important part. The distance drifted during this period is L equals half a t square. And I want a tau square. And I'll pause over here. The first question, forget about how I get half a tau square. We'll talk about that a little bit later. But the first question that comes to my mind is, why are we talking about the distance drifted during this average time? That doesn't make sense to me because remember how we defined drift velocity? Distance L over a long time. You're supposed to calculate the distance over a long time and then divide by that long time to get the average value. That makes sense. But now we're doing something different. We're calculating the distance drifted during this average time. And I don't know why we are doing that. As of now, I don't know why we are doing that. That's problem one. Now problem two is this. Um, Okay, for some reason we are doing that, let's say, but you get it as half a tau square. How does that make sense? How, why would you get half a tau square? It's another question that I really don't understand. So, um, and, and I'll give you an example of why it wouldn't make sense for me. Um, so let's let's take some numbers and it'll make, it'll make things a little easier. Let's say that T1 is two, T2 is three, milliseconds, nanoseconds, whatever you want to take. I'm taking some random number so that they add up to give you some nice number, all right? So in our case, tau would be the average of this and that would be, if you add up, you'll actually get, um, and divide by five, you'll get six, all right? So what professor is doing now is saying, let's calculate the distance drifted during the six minutes. And I'm not even sure why we're doing that, but secondly, during the six minutes, can I apply equations of motion? My answer is no. Because if you consider over here, collision can happen in between those six minutes. So for example, if I applied it for my electron from here, then notice after two minutes it collides. Then again after three minutes it collides. So over this entire six minutes, I cannot apply equations of motion. I cannot use S equal to ut plus half at square for the entire thing because collisions might have happened in between. And it's for that reason, again, this doesn't make sense to me. How can you be so sure that it is half a tau squared? And I think this is the part which is a mistake. Um, we can leave it at this, but what I thought of doing is thinking about, okay, what would have I have done if I had continued 
calculating the drift velocity as, as you know, continue over there. And I thought like, okay, then maybe let's think about what would I need to do for this answer to be right? And then probably I'll be able to understand what underlying assumptions have gone over here so as to make this happen. And I think I came up with some pretty nifty insights which actually Feynman brushes over in his text. So I'm gonna abandon this for now and I wanna ask myself, like if I had to continue this, what would I do? Well, I would go back to this definition and I would calculate what L1, L2, L3, L4, L5 are individually because I can apply equations of motion there, okay? So to calculate L1, for example, I would say that, hey, um, S equal to UT plus half AT square. So I would just be L1 equal to U1 T1. U1 is the initial velocity just after that previous collision. Uh, T1 plus half A is the acceleration due to the electric field into T1 square. Similarly, L2 would also be U2 T2 plus half A into T2 square and so on and so forth. And then, when I, then I would add all of them up and divide by the total time. That's what I would do, right? Now, if I do that, what will I get? To save some space, what I'm gonna do is if I add them, let's do it mentally. If I add all of them, I would club the UT part together and I'll club the half A T1 square T2 square part together. So if I do that, this is what I would get as the expression for drift velocity. You can pause and just check that everything makes sense. I've just plugged in these values. UT represents, what exactly is UT? UT is the length that the electron would have traveled if there was no acceleration, right? I mean, if acceleration is zero, then LA becomes equal to UT. So UT represents the distance covered or the displacement of the electron without the acceleration. In other words, displacement of the electrons when there is no electric fields, when it is not connected to any battery or any power source, right? And same will be the case with U2, T2, U, U3, T3, and so on and so forth, right? So this whole thing would represent the total displacement of my electron over a long time if there was no battery attached. And my question is, what would that, what would that be? I know when there is no battery attached, electric current is zero. So what should be the displacement of my electron? Well, it has to be zero because if it was non-zero, then I would get some current. Now you might say, Mahesh, Mahesh, no. How do you know that? There are billions of electrons over there. Some electrons might be going this way and some electrons might be going that way. Well, well remember what how, how we started this derivation? I said that we're gonna calculate what the average speed for one electron is going to be, um, average velocity actually. And then we, we're gonna say that every single electron has the same velocity, remember? I said that. So if a single electron can drift a little bit, automatically, all the other electrons will also drift a little bit automatically and I would get a current. And that's not possible, okay? And if you want to use the other model, you can use the other model and you can convince yourself that this has to be zero. This has to be zero, mainly because um, you consider a billion electrons now and U1, T1 would be the distance traveled by the first electron randomly. U2, T2 would be the distance traveled by the second electron and so on and so forth. Now, when you consider a billion electrons, some will be going this way, some will be going that way. So in, even in that case, you will get this to be zero. So the main reason it's zero is because U1, U2, U3, they're all random, all right? Those velocities are all random. And so when you add them all up, statistically, you should end up with zero, right? So this value goes to zero. And so what would I get with now? What would I end up with? So I'll now end up with the drift velocity to be just this part, half a t1 square plus t2 square, so on and so forth, divided by t1 plus t2 and so on and so forth. And I think this is the correct way to uh, arrive at the drift velocity. And the problem is I'm stuck now, <laughs> okay? I can't go ahead with this without actually calculating what this is going to be. And to be very honest, we need to do a proper rigorous mathematical calculation. Like I think there'll be integrals involved over here because you know um, we're dealing with lots of numbers. But the point is, Let's now compare to what um, Professor Verma got. And in his derivation, because he took this value, he was able to cancel at that tau. And you can see you can't cancel tau. Tau doesn't come into the picture yet because there are squares over here. So there's nothing I can do to cancel it out. And I think that's the mistake that is done over here. But I asked myself, well, what would it take in order for me to be able to cancel all of these things out and so that I would get this to be tau? so that I would get the same answer as what professor has gotten. What would it take? And the answer is, and you can actually get this with a little bit of trial and a little bit of guessing actually, you can start with guessing. The answer is, if 
the time successive time the time of collision time between two collisions happens to be exactly the same for all the collisions if t1 equal to t2 equal to t3 and they all exactly are equal then of course the average time will also be the same which is going to be tau itself right now under this particular assumption let's see if we get tau so what will happen under this assumption under this assumption this will be t square plus t square plus t square plus t square n t square and what this would be t plus t plus t this will be nt the n and n will cancel out the t and t will cancel out and you'll only end up with t which is the tau and so now you'll get whatever professor verma has gotten but it was under the assumption that t1 equals t2 equals up to um, all of them are equal to tau which means you know what he has done his assumption is and i'm going to get rid of this his assumption is that He's converted this motion and averaged it out and said that, hey, this is similar to assuming that every single collision takes the exact same amount of time, which is tau. And now if you think about it, now this statement makes sense. If we assume that the time of collision stays the same for all the n collisions, then to calculate the average value, I can just average it out over here over one of those instances, one of those um, successive collisions, because for every other successive collisions, everything stays the same. And I think that's exactly what Professor has done over here. He has only calculated the average value over one particular interval and assumed that the time for that is tau, which is not true. The time for that is not tau. He's taken an average value like that. And so the question is, the ultimate billion dollar question now is, are these two equivalent to each other? Can I take this, what's happening really, and convert it into an quote-unquote average model to, to, to do it this way? And the answer is, you can't do it. Like there is, <laughs> I mean, there's nothing that supports that this, these two should be equal, right? I mean, you're averaging something out, but there is no rigorous way you can prove it. In fact, if you do the math, you will actually see that they are not the same things these two will not give you the same result. And that's that. So, I mean, even over here, okay, if you calculate what T1 square plus T2 square plus T3 square and divide by T1 plus T2, if you do that for this, you will get some answer over here to be somewhat around 9.133 or something. That's what you would get. Versus when you use this model, this just becomes, this number just becomes tau and you get six. And you can clearly see that that's an underestimate. This is underestimating what the actual value is. And if you do, and, and right now I took some random values, but if you take a proper statistical uh, analysis, in which case all the values between zero to infinity are possible. Like that's basically how you do it statistically, right? So, uh, you know, you have an average value, but your actual time of collision, when you have considered billion collisions, can be zero also. And you can also have like almost infinite, but the chances of that happening is also very small. So you have to put all of that together and calculate what the mean value or the average value is going to be. But if you do that, you will actually find that this number happens to be twice this number. This number ends up becoming two times tau. It will be two times tau. And I can't prove that right now. I'm not going to attempt to do it. And that's how that two and two will cancel out. And what you will end up getting is half into a into tau and not this. The mistake is assuming that tau is actually the time between two successive collisions for all the collisions. That assumption that has been made over here, that is causing all the problems. This is what I think, what I have gathered based on my understanding. I could be wrong and I would love to hear what your thoughts are. Are there some mistakes that I have made in this in this uh, argument? Are there certain, uh, yeah, just like let me know. Let's start a discussion and I'll reply to all the comments. See you.